On the night of May 28th, after being swapped by the Cincinnati Reds at Wrigley Field, the Cubs held the worst record in the National League. On June 8th, following a sweep at the hand of Shohei Otani and the Angels, they sat at 26-36. While Milwaukee's 7.5 game lead over them in the division was not insurmountable, there weren't many signs that the Cubs were about to go on some run and make up all that ground. Being 6.5 games back of the wild card was also not a terrible spot to be in, but with both the Marlins and Phillies surging, the Dodgers taking up the top spot, and a hot streak from both the Mets and the Padres seeming imminent, there wasn't lots of hope for that either. It seems like this team was destined to sell what they could at the trade deadline, with Cody Bellinger, Marcus Stroman, and Jan Gomes being the guys who could fetch the greatest returns. Well, a lot can change in a couple months. Since June 8th, the Cubs have gone 32-18, with the majority of that success coming post-All-Star break. Though they stumbled out the gates starting the second half 1-4, a July 18th win against the Nats, in which the Cubs scored 17 unanswered runs, signaled a changing of the tide. They'd take that series against Washington, then win 3-4 against St. Louis, 2-2 two two against the White Sox, 3-4 against St. Louis again, which included one of the best plays of the year by Mike Talkman. Back goes Talkman on the warning track. Leaps up! Did he make the catch? He did! What a play! Tottman took a home run away from Burles. This brought the Cubs to their biggest series of the year against the Cincinnati Reds going into the trade deadline. Of course, as the Cubs began to surge, the Reds went on an absolute tear, grabbing first place from the Brewers and becoming one of the most exciting teams in the league. The Cubs were beginning to catch up though, and following the hot streak were just 4 games back of the Reds for the division lead and 3.5 back on the wildcard. The team had also just changed course in terms of their trade deadline strategy, committing to making a run for the rest of Bellinger's and Stroman's contracts, rather than selling those guys like previously thought. This was the team's chance to prove the front office right. Before Game 1 though, they made a trade for the best position player available at the deadline, Jamer Candelario, who coincidentally made his MLB debut with the Cubs in 2016. Candelario, a switch hitter with an 823 OPS and good defense at third and first base, filled both a positional need and added some much needed punch to the lineup. The buzz heading into Game 1 was slightly dampened when Marcus Stroman turned in one of his worst starts of the year when his team needed him most. Though Javier Assad carried the Cubs through the rest of the game, and the offense managed to tag Andrew Abbott for 4 runs, it wasn't enough as they dropped the first game 6-5. Deadline day would be quite a different story. All-star Justin Steele was not his usual self on the mound, and gave up 4 earned runs, but the offense exploded for a 20-9 dismantling of Cincinnati, featuring a 4-5 debut from Jamer Candelario. Game 3 would be more of the same, Drew Smiley failed to make it out of the 5th, but the Cubs won 16-6 with Candelario going 4 for 4. Their 36 runs over these two games was their most in a two game stretch since 1900. The Cubs came back down to earth in game 4, but still deliver the dagger behind a solid start from Jamison Tyone. Though this was their most important series yet, the next would be their greatest test, with the juggernaut Atlanta Braves coming to Wrigley for a three game set. While it's impossible to figure out a ton from just a few games, these would help determine whether the Cubs were pretenders or contenders. The Braves would win Game 1 8-0, tagging Kyle Hendricks for 7 earned in the 4th inning. Once again though, the Cubs bounced back in a big way. They rode a big first inning and a clutch performance out of the bullpen by Julian Merriweather to victory, but almost blew it on multiple occasions because of the Braves' explosive offense. Justin Steele towed the mound for the rubber match and once again was not sharp, but he was picked up by a lights out Cubs bullpen, and with a few clutch hits, the Cubs were able to take the series. They're now tied for the final wildcard spot, and just 1.5 back from the Brewers now for the division lead. They also have the best run differential and expected record in the NL Central by far, and their schedule eases up over the next couple of weeks, so things are looking immensely better than they did just a month ago. How did this happen, and who's led the way? Well, the very short answer that ignores the great efforts of lots of guys on the team is Cody Bellinger. July's NL Player of the Month, Bellinger has hit 415 with 9 homers since July 1st, all while providing good defense in center field and at first base. Just a couple years removed from being the worst everyday player in Major League Baseball, Bellinger is now hitting 326 with 16 home runs, 53 RBI, and a 925 OPS, along with 17 stolen bases and 3.7 war in 81 games. This won't be another MVP season, thanks to some injuries and the existence of Ronald Acuna, but it'll easily be Bellinger's second best full season in his career so far. Mike Talkman has been almost as key as Bellinger. After not playing at all in the majors in 2022, the Cubs picked him up as a minor league free agent. 
Talkman didn't make the team out of spring training, but was called up in place of an injured Bellinger in mid-May. Since then, he's risen to the role of the Cubs' leadoff hitter, a spot from where he's hit 299 with a 372 on base and a 875 OPS. I don't think there's a Cubs hitter who's been better at rising to the occasion in clutch moments this year, as he is hitting 333 with runners in scoring position and has stolen victory from the jaws of defeat in multiple moments both at the plate and on the field, with the most notable of these moments coming against the Cardinals on July 28th when he robbed Alec Burleson of a walk-off home run in a moment that made the Cubs' recent success feel like more of a miracle run than just any normal hot streak. Talkman's been especially key post-All-Star break, where in 21 games, he's hitting 362 with an OPS north of 1. Moving to the infield, it's impossible to talk about the Cubs' success this year without mentioning Dansby Swanson. He had his fair share of naysayers after signing a $177 million deal with the team after his first full good season offensively, but if any of those naysayers remain at this point, they are stupid. Swanson's OPS now sits around 800, which would be his highest mark since 2020. While he's walking more than he has since his rookie season, his power has also come very alive in the second half, as he's hit 7 home runs and 3 doubles in just 15 games, leading to an OPS of 1.11 since the break. It's also hard to overstate how good Swanson has been at shortstop, as evidence of that, he leads the MLB in outs above average and should easily win his second straight gold glove. With 4 war on the year, he leads the Cubs and is easily replicating his breakout 2022. To the right of Swanson in the infield is Nico Horner. As you'd expect following his great defense at short last year, Nico's been elite with the glove. He's six in the league in outs above average and tied for first among guys whose primary position is second base. While he hasn't taken the step forward lots of fans thought he'd take offensively, he is starting to hit for more power and get on base more in the second half with an 816 OPS. Being on track for a second straight four war season, Nico's become a cornerstone for the Cubs and has a lot of productive years ahead of him. While 2022 All-Star Ian Happ had a largely disappointing first half, he did stay an above average hitter by walking more than every other Major League Baseball player besides Juan Soto, and since the break, much like Dansby Swanson, he has found the power. Though his average and on base have stayed the same, Hap slugging has gone from a meek 386 before the break to 531 in the 22 games since. Nick Madrigal, after having a horrible time of it last year, has taken it upon himself to save his whole career by moving over to third base and defying the odds by becoming an excellent defender despite never having previously played there. While he's still not been the elite contact hitter he was sold as, he's hitting enough singles and getting on base enough through walks and hit by pitches to be a player who no one scoffs at when they see him in the lineup. The last hitter I'll talk about in any detail will be Christopher Morel, who's firmly been the second best hitter on the team this season, with 17 home runs in 69 games, an 869 OPS, and a whole lot of energy. He's another guy who's risen to the occasion in big moments, as he's had a 953 OPS with runners in scoring position, and an OPS above 1.2 with runners in scoring position and two outs. With all of these guys, along with Jan Gomes, Miguel Amaya, and now Jamer Candelario, the Cubs have a lot of capable hitters who are firing on all cylinders. There's also Seiya Suzuki, who has taken on a decreased role but still might have more to offer, as well as Patrick Wisdom, who has 19 home runs in 75 games and 5 already in the second half. All in all, this offense leads MLB in runs by a wide margin since the All-Star break at 164, with the Dodgers coming in at second place with 130. Of course, we also need pitching to win games, and while none of the Cubs starters have excelled in the second half save for Jamison Tyone, their bullpen has been massive in securing all of these wins. Coming into the year without any defined closer, manager David Ross tried out free agent Michael Fulmer, but that was somewhat of a disaster. He later pivoted to Adbert Alzali, a guy who for years seemed to have lots of talent but could never put it together as a starter. Alzali, whose ERA has stayed in the mid to low twos, has had a rough outing here and there but he's been mostly lights out as a closer and become one of the faces of this run they've been on. With a high strikeout rate, a minuscule walk rate, and a newfound ability to limit hard contact, it doesn't look like Alzali is going to be relinquishing this role anytime soon. And honestly, I think watching his reactions and emotions pour out after getting a save has become one of my favorite things about watching the Cubs. Free agent acquisition Michael Fulmer also deserves quite a bit of credit. After a horrible first month of the season and then an even worse May, he had many calling for his DFA, but since the start of June, he's given up just four earned runs in 28 and two-thirds innings in mostly lower leverage spots. Mark Leiter Jr. has been excellent as a lefty killer and has come through in a lot of high leverage moments. He's basically the setup man now, and then Julian Merriweather and the rookie Daniel Palencia have rounded out a pretty good cast of guys that come in when the game is tight. 
Meanwhile, Javier Assad and Hayden Wisniewski have both been great long relievers and have saved this bullpen on multiple occasions by throwing 3-5 innings of scoreless or one-run ball when starters have to come out early. Jed Hoyer has also added Jose Quas from the Royals to this bullpen. He struggles a lot with walks but gets a lot of Ks and has a fun delivery that gives him a solid ceiling as a reliever. There is a lot of baseball ahead for the Cubs and not a ton of room for error as they are far from the only team in this race, but even with that, they are in a better position than I think any fans could imagine just a couple months ago, and a run like this, especially if it ends with a playoff berth, could be pivotal towards attracting free agents. With the contracts of Kyle Hendricks, Jason Hayward, most likely Marcus Stroman, and most likely Cody Bellinger coming off the books, the Cubs will have a lot of money to spend in possibly bringing back Belly or Candelario, and or reinforcing the pitching staff through a guy like Blake Snell or Yoshinobu Yamamoto, or they could say screw all that and go for, well, you know who. So thank you guys for watching, hope you enjoyed this video, please like if you did, and subscribe if you're new, I'll see you in the next one.